Well, good morning. Oh, everybody's having a good morning here. It's great to hear all the laughter. We still have some folks walking in. We just want to take this time to welcome you to church this morning. Uh, whether you're joining us in person or online, we're so excited to have you here together uh, to worship the Lord this morning. If you're visiting with us this morning, we ask if you would just take a minute. In the pew in front of you, you'll find a little welcome card. It says welcome on it. If you wouldn't mind just taking a moment, filling that out. We'd love to have a record of you being here and worshiping with us this morning. And you can drop that in one of the offering baskets uh, on the way out this morning. Uh, it's also a way if you'd like to uh, talk with one of the pastors to uh, have prayer or just to learn about what's going on here at the church, how you can get involved. Uh, you can use that card as well, and we would love to get in touch with you and talk to you and pray with you as well. Our scripture reading comes from Psalm 111 this morning. I'm going to be reading the first four verses. It says, I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. The works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. His work is honorable and glorious, and his righteousness endures forever. He has made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. Uh, we're going to try something a little bit different this morning. Will you stand with me as we pray and as we move into our time of worship? God, we thank you uh, for this morning that we could come into your house and worship you here this morning. We're so grateful for the opportunity to gather together and to see you work amongst the body of believers here today. And so we just ask this morning as we uh, worship you through song, Lord, that you would just be preparing our hearts for the message that you will bring through Pastor Stephen this morning. We're just so grateful that we have a place like this where we could gather together with those who are like-minded uh, to encourage one another, to pray for one another, and to prepare to be sent out for this week that you've prepared for us, Lord, as we look to minister to this community that you've placed us in. And I pray this morning, Lord, that we will remember our brothers and sisters around the country. We think of those uh, along the East Coast and down South who are dealing and rebuilding, uh, beginning to come through uh, Hurricane Ian here, Lord, and and thinking, where do I go from here, Lord? I pray that you would just make yourself known to them, that you would just continue to use uh, those in the church down there uh, to reveal yourself to them through works, through actions, through our words. And um, we're just thankful for the church and the role that you give us to be a part of this world and to be a part of the kingdom work that you've provided, Lord. We just thank you now, and we just ask that you would just bless us and that we would just worship you well here this morning, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Bye. If, if you want to stay, if you're able to stay standing us for our first song, We Bow Down, we're 31. <clears throat> You are Lord of creation and Lord of my life, Lord of the land and the sea. You were Lord of the heaven before there was time, and Lord of all lords you will be. We bow down and we worship you, Lord, we bow down. And we worship you, Lord, we bow down. And we worship you, Lord, Lord of all, Lord, you will be. You are king of the nation and king of my life, king of the land and the sea. You were king of the heavens before there was time, and king of all kings you will be. We bow down and we will serve you, Lord. We bow down and we will you the king. We bow down and we crown you the king. King of all kings you will be. All right, if you, if you want to sit down, that'd be fine. If you want to stay standing, that'd be fine. Worthy of worship, number three. <coughs> worthy of worship, worthy of praise. Worthy of honor and glory, worthy of all the glad 
glad songs we can sing worthy of all of the offering we bring you are worthy father creator you are worthy savior sustainer you are worthy worthy and wonderful worthy of worship and praise worthy of reverence worthy of fear worthy of love and devotion worthy of bowing and bending of knees worthy of all this and all the to these you are worthy father creator you are worthy Mighty Father, Master and Lord, King of all kings and Redeemer, worthy for Counselor, Comforter, Friend, Savior and Source of our life without end, you are worthy, Father, Creator, you are worthy. Savior, Sustainer, you are worthy. Worthy and wonderful, worthy of worship and praise. It's for the trust and obey. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory we shed on our way. The truth good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly repay. Not a grief for a loss, not a frown or a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. But we never can prove the delight of his love until all on the altar we lay for the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for them who will trust and obey trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet we will sit at his feet or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do where he sends, we will go. Never fear, only.
me trust and obey trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in jesus but to trust and obey normally they only hear that at invitation time but the words of that and that's wonderful that's beautiful 101, how deep the Father's love for us. <clears throat> how deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son. Son, to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The Father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one. Bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath he brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ. His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Oh, Sister Linda Smith, come right here. And company. Well, put a pencil to each one. When my soul was disturbed with sorrow we 
and it's filled with many alarms. Trust in Jesus and He will keep you in the shelter of His arms. There is peace in the time of trouble. There is peace in the midst of the storm. There is peace though the world be with us at least for a short time uh, there with that and thankful that Mike could spare her for a few weeks here for us and we're blessed to have her with us and so thank you very much but a, I think a message of hope that we have there right that we can have peace even in the midst of conflict uh, there through Jesus Christ Second uh, Corinthians chapter 5 if you go ahead and find your place there we'll hold our place there and then we'll go to Lord in prayer this, this morning as we get ready to go to Lord in prayer this morning I think we certainly want to remember uh, the folks down there in Florida, they are still kind of recovering and evaluating uh, there, and so continue to pray for them that God will be with them. Uh, one of the blessings that we have uh, as Southern Baptists is that we have the opportunity to bound, uh, kind of work together, bind together, and by doing so, we can do more. And so one of the privileges that we have is that we have the opportunity to send relief teams down. So send relief, is disaster relief is uh, heading down there uh, to minister, even some of the Folks here from Indiana, Chainsaw Gangs, are going down uh, to work out there. I know other uh, state conventions have mud out teams uh, that will be helping. There'll be disaster relief food teams that are going out. And so uh, as you pray for the people as they recover, I want to encourage you also to pray for our disaster relief teams that are going down. That They are intentional, uh, as we're going to talk about this morning, to show the love of Christ and also to share the love of Christ. And... Um, in these midst of dark times, right, we can find peace in the arms of Jesus Christ. And that's the message that we want to share with people that possibly have lost everything. That if you have Jesus Christ, you may have lost the world's possessions, but you have something far greater when you have Jesus Christ. And so we want to encourage that. So be praying for those uh, there as they go down as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. God, we are grateful for the opportunity we come and to come in, in safety and in comfort, Lord, that we uh, had... Uh, all of our, our kind of amenities, Lord, that we could turn the electricity on this morning and not worry about that. We could turn the tap on and get a drink of water and not be afraid of that. We didn't have to look at the structure of our house this morning. But Lord, we think of our friends and our family and even those we don't know down in Florida and in Carolina right now, Lord, that are uh, wrestling with some of those things. Some that are still sitting in the dark and waiting for the power to come back on. Some that have lost homes and possessions and Lord, their world has been turned upside down. Uh, Lord, we just pray for them right now that you would just be with them. We think of those crews that are still continuing to search, that uh, you would just bless and watch over them, that you would guide them, that there are any survivors that are uh, there, that you would help them to be rescued and brought to safety in that place of uh, security there, Lord. Lord, we pray for our disaster relief teams. Uh, we think particularly here of the, the Southern Baptist disaster relief teams that are going down, Lord, that you would just bless and watch over those. We think of the uh, other Christian organizations that are sending teams down to help to be a blessing there, Lord, that you would minister through them, that as they serve people, they would do so with the love of Christ there in their hearts, and that, Lord, they would also share the love of Christ there with their lips. So we think of those whose world has been turned upside down, that you would 
even use this opportunity to point them towards Jesus Christ, that He is all that we need, even in the midst of these storms. And so, God, we pray that you would just be with them right now. Lord, we pray that you would just uh, be with us in our time together as so they open up your word this morning, that you would challenge us through your word, that you would change us through your word, through your Holy Spirit this morning. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is where we're going there. And it talks there a little bit about our motivation. Um, Throughout this week, I kind of looked at, we've seen some of these runners. Uh, Yesterday, our town had the 5K, Limestone 5K, and as we got to see some of those that were walking and running, and then uh, got to see our son yesterday, and he's in ROTC, and some of the running that he does with that, and just talking to others and some of the running. One of the things that I'm reminded of is, I hate to run. I... I, it, I know I know I should, you know, it's like one of those things like I know I should do that, I should be healthier and more physically fit, and I should get out there and run and walk, but if you see me running, there's probably something chasing me behind it. <laughs> and then I hear stories of like my cousin, and my cousin, his son, uh, did a 24-hour run for fundraising. I, I, you know, I get like running for a minute, and I'm about ready to throw up, you know, I, how do you do 24 hours? I, And what I'm convinced of, the only reason that you can run for 24 hours or the only reason that you run marathons or ultra marathons or Ironmans or the only reason you run more than 100 meters uh, is because you love it. You just enjoy running and you enjoy the feeling. I'm not one of those, but you enjoy that. That love for it compels you, motivates you to get up early when it's still dark, to uh, make yourself sick doing this, but you do it because you love it. And I think it's a, a wonderful kind of example as we look at that. What is our motivation for doing what we do? Well, why do we do? Why did you get up this morning and get changed and get ready and sacrifice sleeping in in order to come to church and to Sunday school to sit together uh, with other people and some weird people that are here as well you're not one of those, but the person that's sitting next to you might be. Um, why do you do that? Why do we, uh, at the end of the service, we talk about giving financially. And why would you give financially of your hard-earned money that you've worked for throughout this week? And you could think of a hundred different things that you could do with that money. Why, as we talked about uh, serving, and, and even those the disaster relief teams that on their own dime are picking up what they're doing and driving down to a place and to people they don't even know to help them do hard work that they'll be sweating there and, and uh, sacrificing. Uh, why would they do that? And I think as we come to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting there verse 14, we see what our motivation should be. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, it says this, For the love of Christ compels us. Because we judge thus that as one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Now therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we've known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation." Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, as all things are of God, who has reconciled us to Himself through the ministry of Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then... We are ambassadors for Christ. As a God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. As we look at this passage, the first thing that we see is our motivation. And that motivation is, as the love motivates us. So we've been looking these last several weeks at love and, and the importance of the love of Jesus Christ. And what we understand it is, it is love 
that motivates us. That's what the Apostle Paul says there in verse 14. For the love of Christ compels us. It, it, it pushes us forward. It drives us there with that. And so what we see is the love of Jesus Christ urges us to serve. Now, some look at this and they would say, well, is that my love for Jesus Christ or Jesus Christ's love for me? Well, 1 John chapter 4, verse 19 would help us to understand that, right? We love Him because He first loved us. So even the love that we have for Jesus Christ comes because He loved us first. Uh, And so when we look at this, because He loves us, we're compelled then to serve. The the greatest motivation that we can have is love. That's what motivates those runners to get up and to run when it's dark, to run for hours at a time, to push past the pain and, and past the sickness and And to keep on running, why? Because they love it. They they enjoy the experience. They enjoy what it produces. They enjoy just being there and running the wind in their hair. And so what motivates us to get up and to serve Jesus Christ? What motivates us to serve should be the love of Jesus Christ. Because He loves me so much, and because He has demonstrated that love, and because He loves me on a daily basis, and Uh, moves and works in my my life and cares for me, because of that love, I go and I serve Jesus Christ. It's interesting, the Apostle Paul used that word compels. That word compels there is the idea that it walls us in. That, uh, you know, is that flash flood that comes, we know which direction it's going because it's got the walls that kind of push it in that direction. And that's what Paul's saying, I'm pushed in that direction. And I think it's interesting as we look at that idea of walled in because it helps us to remember that in life, in order to say yes to the best things, sometimes we have to say no to the good things. Uh, there are a lot of things that are competing for your time and for your attention, for your energy. And, and a lot of times they're good things. They're, they are. They're really good things. And they're things that wouldn't be bad for you to invest yourself in. Like this is, this is not an argument like, should I serve Jesus Christ or should I go out and serve the world and get involved in sin? and get No, sometimes what we have to understand is that saying yes to Jesus Christ means there's some good things over here. Maybe there's some community things or maybe there's some family things or maybe there's some uh, hobbies or some interests that I have. And they're, there's, they're great things, but they're not the best things. And the best things is to serve Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul said, I, you know, I, I could have been an academic and studied there in Jerusalem and be a great professor at the University of Jerusalem, but the love of Christ compelled me in a different direction. I, I could have I, you know, went out and earned a lot of money and, and had a great flourishing business, yet the love of Christ compelled It walled me in. It said, this is the best thing. Pursue this. And so the love of Christ compels us to serve. But what we also see with this as we look at this passage, that in Christ we've died to our old ways and we now live to Jesus Christ. Notice what he says there in verse 14, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but he who died uh, for them and rose again. Uh, And it reminds us here of this, that... uh, because of what Jesus Christ has done for us, we now should live for Jesus Christ. He uses that picture that if one died for all, then all have died. And as we look at that word all, we understand this, that the sacrifice and death of Jesus Christ is sufficient for all of mankind. That all of mankind could be saved because of the work of Jesus Christ, that it has enough power in it to rescue and deliver all of mankind, and yet tragically not all of mankind will be saved. And so as we look at this passage, the context would lead us to believe that it is all those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Uh, That when we identified with faith, with Jesus Christ, we recognized that we were dead in our sins, that we couldn't get to God on our own. We put our faith and trust in Christ, and our sins were placed on Christ, and He died in our place. In, In that way, we died in Christ. Our old man, who we were before Jesus Christ, died in Christ so that we could be made alive in Jesus Christ. As he resurrected from the dead, he gives to us his resurrection life. That I'm a new creation in Christ. I've been made alive. 
I'm spiritually alive now, that I'm now to live for Jesus Christ. My old man was crucified with Christ, was put away, it's dead, no longer has power and authority over me, so that now I live for Jesus Christ. My old way of living changes. And so that is how this motivates us. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. If you have your Bibles, let's go to Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. It says it, that same idea in another way. That our old way of living is to be put to death, it's crucified with Christ on the cross, that we now no longer live for ourselves. It's not about what is pleasing to me, what I want to do. It's not about uh, how this benefits me. Now I'm living for Jesus Christ, that, that He becomes the driving force of my life. What is pleasing to Jesus Christ? What does Jesus Christ want me to do? He's purchased me with His own blood so that I could live for Him. He empowers me with His Holy Spirit. How do I now serve Him? Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. Our, our old body of sin is crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm now living for Jesus Christ. He has become my purpose for living. And so, in Christ, our old way is put to death. We now live for Jesus Christ because of the love that he showed us, that he can reconcile us back to God through the sacrifice that he gave there for us. So the love of Christ motivates us to serve. Secondly, the love of Christ changes the way that I see people. The way that I view people is now changed because I've experienced the love of Jesus Christ. There in verse 16, Therefore, because I'm motivated by the love of Christ and that He died for all and I'm now living for Him, uh, from now on we regard no one according to the flesh, even though uh, we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know Him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, He is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. And so it reminds me of two things. One is that I no longer view the world as the way that I used to view the world. He uses that term according to the flesh. And that flesh there is that a part... Uh, that way of thinking, that way of living that is apart from God. It's not God's way of living. That's in the Spirit. The, the way of living apart from God is in the flesh. And so I, I don't regard people or think of people after the flesh just as I changed my thinking of Jesus Christ, the way that I thought about Jesus Christ changed. Uh, and so as I, I thought of this, I thought, what are, what are some ways that we often view people after the flesh? And so I What's the world's way of viewing people? And in reality, we can probably very simply put this. The world often thinks of people in this term of, what can you do for me? We often view people through that lens of, what can you do for me? How can you help me? How can you benefit me? How does this relationship help me? How does this relationship benefit me, right? Uh, don't we often see that in marriages? And, and not so much in marriages, but in divorces, where people in divorce say, it was no longer working for me. I, I, I was no longer fulfilled in this anymore. Uh, see, as, as long as it was beneficial to me, it was a productive relationship. When it stopped being beneficial to me, uh, I stopped caring about it. And that's often the way that we view people, right? Uh, that's the way the world views people. Hopefully, we've changed in that. The world views people as what can you do for me? If, if you have an ability to help me, to benefit me, to, to propel me a little bit further on, uh, then I have a use for you. And if you, there's nothing that you can do for me, uh, I've got no time for you, right? That's oftentimes, right? We, we see that homeless person on the street and they have nothing there. And so what do we often do? We just walk right past because what can you do? You can't do anything for me. You can't help me in any way. You just want to be a drain on my resources. And, and so I, I have no time for that. And that's the world's way of thinking. What can I get for you, from you? What do we have in common? As long as we have something in common, we can enjoy. But as long as we don't have anything in common, God's view of people are different. And there's two things that I think that we want to highlight as we look about God's view of people. Number one is this. Uh, people are created 
in the image of God. We go back to Genesis chapter 1, we understand that it was in the image of God he created man. And so every person, even though that person, that image, uh, God's image in that person is marred by sin, still retains the image of God. Every person is created in the the image of God. So even a person that I disagree with vehemently, maybe they have different morals than I do. Maybe they have a different political stand than I do. Maybe they're from a different class than I am. Uh, that person still possesses the image of God. And if they're made in God's image, the way that I treat them often reflects what I think of God. Secondly, that person is a person for whom Jesus Christ died. Jesus desperately loves that person just as he desperately loved me. And so when I think of that person, I need to remember, okay, yet yeah, yeah, maybe we don't have things in common. Maybe we are different, but Jesus loves this person. And I don't want to harm, uh, do anything to harm this person, to push them further away from Jesus Christ. There. And so I need to change the way I'm not thinking about people, about what can they do for me. Instead, I want to look at this person as viewed in the image of God, that this is a person that Jesus Christ loves and cares for. So it changes the way that I look at the world. Secondly, it changes the way that I look at fellow believers. All right? Because through the power of the gospel, we've been brought into this beautiful body called the church. Now, we jokingly said this earlier, that there's some strange people in here. But the reality is, there's some strange people in here. There's not some people in here uh, that, uh, given natural circumstances, I'd sit around and fellowship with. They've got different interests than I am. They've got different, maybe, classes than I am. Uh, they, they just aren't. And yet, because of the bond that we have in Jesus Christ, what unites us is far greater than that which divides us. And so the Apostle Paul said, we, we don't regard anyone after the flesh. And then he goes on to say there in verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, right? that son's a person who's trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, they're now within the body of Christ. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. This is a wonderful promise that we have, right? In Jesus Christ, we have been made new. Our old way of living and our all our mistakes and our failures in the past have been wiped away, and we've become a new creation in Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 8. If you have your Bible, uh, hold your place there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's flip over to Romans chapter 8. You may want to put a bookmark in Romans, because we're going to come back here in a couple more minutes uh, there. Romans chapter 8, starting there in verse 8, it says this, So then... Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. If we're unsaved, we cannot be pleasing to God. But you, talking to believers here, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And so uh, when we trust in Christ as Savior, we were indwelt with the Holy Spirit. We are in the Spirit. Verse 10, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. We have been made new creatures. We were once dead, now made alive in Jesus Christ. And as we are now alive in Jesus Christ, as we're new creations in Jesus Christ, I need to recognize that every other person who has also trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, has also been made new. We are a new creation in Christ. It also reminds me then that who I am, now that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, is defined by Jesus Christ, and not by what I think of myself, or not by what other people say about me. I'm defined now by Jesus Christ. But I'm a new creation in Christ. He, I am who He says than I am. And I need to derive my sense of identity from who Jesus Christ says that I am, who He has made me as a new creature, as a new creation in Jesus Christ. And that's the way also that I need to view people. As I look around at these fellow believers that we're privileged to worship Jesus Christ with, if they trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, they too are also new creations. 
They are the person that Christ has made them, and they are the person becoming the person that Christ has given that identity to, and I need to recognize that in them and trust that they'll recognize that in me. We offer and extend that grace to each other because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. So it changes the way that I see people. I don't look at the world through what can they do for me. I look at the world as people created in the image of God who are loved by Jesus Christ. And I look at fellow believers as new creations in Christ who have their identity together from Jesus Christ as well. We're on this journey together to follow and pursue Jesus Christ. So love motivates me. Love changes the way that I see people. Love moves me to serve others. So we talked about that. What would motivate someone to get up and to go all the way down to another state where it's high humidity and hot and get out there and work on chainsaws and somebody else's property or to, to get shovels and brooms and to mud out somebody else's house and to tear out the sheetrock and the insulation and what motivates somebody to do that? What motivates someone to give money to Life Food Pantry or to Hope Resource Center? What motivates somebody to give of their time to help there at the men's warming shelter or Becky's place? What motivates somebody to help the neighbor across the street who is lonely and spends way too much time talking about things I don't really care about? What what motivates some of those people? We see that in verse 18. Now all these things are of God who has reconciled us to Himself through Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not imputing the trespasses to them, and has committed to us the world, a word of reconciliation. You'll notice this, that we model our serving after the serving of Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 2 gives us a wonderful example of the serving of Jesus Christ, who being in the form of God, uh, there with all the glories of heaven, willingly set aside uh, the glories of heaven to take on human form, and there in human form He willingly suffered on our behalf, suffered to the point of death, even the death of the cross, so that He could reconcile us to God. Uh, when we talk of serving, you have never served more than you have been served by Jesus Christ. You have never, I mean, I, this is just, I, this is much more than I was ever planning on doing. Well, you haven't done as much as Jesus Christ has done. The model of our serving is sacrificial serving based upon what Jesus Christ has done for us. We generously give because Jesus Christ has generously sacrificed for us, right? We, we don't give in order for that beautiful feeling that we get. You know, I just you feel good, and I feel good when I give. And I, well, see, then I'm serving myself. I don't give even necessarily sometimes to help somebody else. Because sometimes as we help others, we get taken advantage of. And, and I don't know about you, but it, me and my human nature, it irritates me when somebody takes advantage of me. I, I gave this to help you, and all of a sudden you used me or exploited me, and uh, you know what you said wasn't true, and I feel taken advantage of. We give because Jesus Christ gave to us. Now, now that doesn't mean that we don't use wisdom and intelligence as we give, that God uh, wants us to use wisdom with that, but our motivation is motivated our model is modeled after the service of Jesus Christ. We have been served by Jesus Christ. As we've been served, we serve others. We also show the love of others so that we can help people to be reconciled to God. Right? The, the motivation of our ministry is so that people will experience the love of God and that we'll have the opportunity to share the love of God. One of the beautiful things that we love is uh, disaster relief and send relief goes down to places like Florida in the midst of this, is that they do wonderful help. There's mill teams and mud out teams, and they serve in practical ways. There's no requirements that you know you have to do. That. But as they're doing that, oftentimes people will ask them the question, what would cause you to come from this faraway state down to where we are 
uh, in the midst of this chaos and to come help us. Why, why are you here? And it's a wonderful opportunity for us to say, hey, we've been helped by Jesus Christ, and we want to introduce you to Jesus Christ. We want you to experience a relationship with God who is far greater than even what you're going through here at the moment. And we have the opportunity to share with others the hope that we have in Christ. Our motivation is that we'll have the ability to share the hope that we have. We show the love of Christ to others so that they too can be reconciled to God. It's interesting. He talks about the ministry of reconciliation. We understand that ministry deals with the idea of serving, right? The ministry of reconciliation. But not only have we been given the ministry of reconciliation, we've been given the word of reconciliation. You know, what's the word of reconciliation? Well, very simply, that's the gospel message, right? That Jesus Christ has taken our sin upon himself and died in our place. Uh, so that we can be forgiven and risen again, so that we can have new life, and that we can be reconciled back to God. That we have been the rebels against the rightful king, and yet that king sacrificed himself to restore our relationship and bring us back into relationship. We can be reconciled with God. It's wonderful to serve. We need to serve. But accompanying our service... We need to speak. Right? Sometimes people have said, you know, share the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. Here's the reality. It is necessary to use words to share the gospel. We can live the change the gospel makes. We can live out the gospel. But in order to share the gospel, we need words. This is why it's the word of reconciliation. That we need to go to people and, and help to recognize that, yes, do you need to understand that you are a sinner, that, that your sin separates you from God, that you're living now in rebellion against the rightful king, and yet that rightful king has provided a path for you to be reconciled, that you can receive that gift by faith. And that's the fourth thing that we see. Our message then is love. Love is our motivation. I mean, love changes the way that we see people. Love encourages us to serve people. But the message that we share is that of love. Verse 20 and 21. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. And so Christ, we're pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And, and how are we reconciled to God? He made Him, that is Jesus Christ, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. We have that great privilege to represent Jesus Christ as an ambassador. An ambassador is one who represents his country to another country. Now, this was written during the time of the Roman Empire. and At the time of the Roman Empire, there were two types of provinces in the Roman Empire. There were senatorial provinces and there were imperial provinces. Senatorial provinces were peaceful to the Roman Empire. They wanted to be part of the Roman Empire. They were uh, in agreement with the Roman Empire, and so they were very peaceful with the Roman Empire. Because of this, there were no troops stationed in senatorial provinces. Uh, but the second type of province was an imperial province. An imperial province was probably often a, a province that was conquered. Uh, they were often hostile to the Roman Empire. That They didn't want to be part of the Roman Empire. So it was often dangerous. There, there was that potential there for rebellion uh, given the right circumstance. And so Rome kept the peace by stationing troops. Troops were stationed there. But not only were troops stationed in those empires, those empires also were sent ambassadors. Ambassadors were those who would represent Rome to these people. And they would share Rome's desires. And then they would also work with these people to take these people's message back to the empire. They were that go-between between them. The same is true for us, right? If our president today is going to another nation, let's say uh, we have a little bit of conflict there with Russia... It doesn't matter what the ambassador to Russia thinks about the country of Russia. It doesn't matter what he thinks of the culture. His opinions are irrelevant. 
What matters when the ambassador of the United States goes to Russia is that he shares the president's opinions. When he speaks, he does not speak on the ambassador's behalf. He speaks on the president's behalf. He speaks the very words that the president himself would be speaking if the president were in that situation. Look at verse 20 again, right? We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. You see, as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, the message that we're to share are the very words that Jesus Christ himself were to be sharing if he were standing here today. We, he would be urging, encouraging people to be reconciled to God. That, that you're now in conflict with God, but there's a way for you to come back and to be reconciled. And so God wants you to be reconciled. I want you to be reconciled. And as ambassadors, that's the message that we share. We represent Jesus Christ to the world around us. We are His ambassadors sent out on a mission to serve Jesus Christ. And so we are to speak in the place of Jesus Christ and to tell others His message. And so what's the message that we share? The message that we share is this. Be reconciled to God. For He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Romans chapter 5 Verse 10 encourages us there with that same message, right? For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Much more than being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. You see, we've offended a righteous and a holy God because we've rebelled against that God by choosing sin and self rather than choosing that God. We've gone that way. We've kind of given God the stiff arm. And we said, no, thank you. I don't want you. I don't want your way. I want me and my way. And we've chosen our way. And we've rebelled against the rightful king. That's verse 10, right? We were enemies. You say, well, I'm not opposed to God. Well, the question is, do we choose sin rather than choosing God? And see, the truth is, for all of sin, to fall short of the glory of God. We've all chosen sin rather than choosing God. We weren't even seeking to be reconciled. We hadn't even come to our senses. And yet God, in His mercy and grace, began moving toward us while we were still hostile towards Him. And He sent His own Son, Jesus Christ, there to die on the cross. As we look at this and understand, we know that Jesus Christ is God, very God, second person of the Trinity, so God Himself stepped into human flesh and form. As He lived, He was the only person that ever lived without sin. The only one not deserving of death, the only one not in rebellion to God, the one that lived in perfect harmony and communion with God. And yet, He willingly went there to the cross, and there on the cross, your sin and my sin was placed there on Jesus Christ, and the sinless one suffered as if he was guilty. I love that song that we sang, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. That line that always gets me there is that one, I hear my mocking voice call out amongst the scoffers. That, that it was your sin and my sin that was placed upon Jesus Christ. And even there at His crucifixion, we were the one ridiculing and mocking. And yet He willingly suffered on our behalf and He took our punishment. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 reminds us that He became cursed for us so that we wouldn't have to bear the curse of sin. That He willingly bore our curse. As we've rebelled against God and rightfully deserved to be punished, He bore that punishment for us. Verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us because it is written... Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That He willingly bore the curse of sin for you and for me so that we could be forgiven. That in itself is great news. right? That burden of shame and guilt that we wrestle with, that we, we deal with, that we often don't tell people about, but is there in the back of our mind, that dark stain on our soul that we know that we have, 
that can be cleansed and can be forgiven. It can be wiped away and be made new. And if it stopped at that, we'd have a reason to rejoice and to celebrate today. But you'll notice it didn't just stop at that, right? So that we could become the righteousness of God in Him. He didn't just wipe away our sin, but all that righteousness that He earned, all the good that He did, He took that and He says, I'm going to impute that, I'm going to place into their account that that we receive righteousness by faith. Not a righteousness that we've earned or that we've done, the righteousness of Jesus Christ given to us. And that's why uh, Paul, when he talks about this, he talks about being justified. And it's more as, as, as sometimes we define justified as just as if I never sinned. That's a part of it. That's the forgiveness part of it. But there's also the imputed righteousness part of it, that I am now as righteous as Jesus Christ is. When God looks at me, if I've put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, He doesn't see me. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And in the eyes of God, I'm as good as Jesus Christ was. Now, I know know me better than that. But because He's given His righteousness to me, I'm perfect in the eyes of God. Philippians chapter 3, verse 9, right? And being found in Him, that is in Jesus Christ, not having mine own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith, the righteousness which is from God by faith. It's the righteousness that is imputed on my behalf. I've been made righteous because of Jesus Christ. That's good news. That's a message of reconciliation. I don't longer have to be hostile to God, and I no longer have to have that enmity that emptiness, that longing, that fear of God in my life anymore, that I can be reconciled to God and that I can live at peace with God. That's what gives us peace in the midst of the storm, right? His arms are open wide and He brings us to Himself and He's provided the pathway for us to come. We can be reconciled to God. This is... And if you haven't gotten this over the past four or five weeks, this is the love of God. This is God's love displayed and demonstrated for us. And so regardless of what we're going through, I can know for a certainty that I am loved by God. Because all I do is I look at the cross of Jesus Christ. That He became sin for us who knew no sin, that we could become the righteousness of God in Him. We are Loved by God. That is also the message that we commemorate today. So we come together today, we come together to celebrate the Lord's table. That two elements that we celebrate there in the Lord's table, right, is the bread and the wine. The bread that was broken on our behalf, that body that was broken for us, that He willingly died in our place. The blood that was shed for us. The price of our forgiveness, the remission of sin, was the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And so as we celebrate it, we are remembering that we are loved by Jesus Christ. This was the price that was paid for me so that I could enjoy communion with God. It also reminds us as we celebrate it together, that I'm not alone in that communion. That there are other people around who have also experienced that love. And now we love each other because of the love of Jesus Christ that has been shed for us and given to us. His love has been shed in our hearts. And as we do that, we love each other. When we come to communion today, We always like to take the opportunity to have a time of self-examination. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the passage that we often read as we look at communion, talks about those who uh, drank the bread unworthily. And as we look at that, we understand, right, that none of us are worthy of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It's given to us by love. It's a demonstration of grace. 
We don't earn it. We receive it as a gift. None of us are worthy. But it was talking about that, that idea of a disrespectful manner. Uh, that we were treating it with contempt. And we do treat the sacrifice of Christ with contempt when we willingly have conflict and we willingly sin against God and against others. And then we come lightheartedly to the body of Christ. And as we come here, be reminded by the elements of the sacrifice of Christ, we are not to treat it lightly or with contempt. And so he talks about that time of self-examination there. Verse 18, first of all, that when you come together, I hear that there's divisions among you, and I part believe it. Uh, for there must be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one's place, eat not the table. Uh, it is not to, is it not to eat the Lord's table? For in eating, one takes his own supper ahead of the other, and the other is hungry and another is drunk. What, do you not have houses to eat or to drink in? And do you not despise the church of God? And shame of, they were coming together and some were going away hungry and some were going away drunk. And he says, that, that's conflict in the body. That's despising each other. That's treating each other after the flesh. Instead, you ought to Drink this worthily. In verse 27, Therefore whoever drinks or eats this bread in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of Christ. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat the bread and drink of the cup. And so, as we come together, it's one of the things that we do is we always like to take the time of self-examination. So I'm going to ask our musicians to come, and they're going to come, and they're going to play uh, some song for us as they play some instrumental music. We're going to take the opportunity to examine our own hearts. If you don't know Christ as Savior, this is a wonderful time just to acknowledge your need and say, God, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that Jesus Christ died on the cross for me and I ask Him to come into my life and to save me. And you can do that right where you're at. If there's conflict, if there's other areas the Holy Spirit points out in your life, you commit to get those right with God today. But in these next few moments of silence, of quiet, as the musicians play, let's have a time of self-examination there today. Lord, as we come together this morning, that is our prayer, that you would search us. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would shine his searchlight in our heart, and if there's anything that is not pleasing to you, then God, may we confess that as sin this morning. May we forsake that as sin this morning, and may we recommit our life to follow you. May your Holy Spirit have his way and will in our lives life. May we no longer live for ourselves, but live for Jesus Christ who died for us. God, if there's conflict that we have with others, may we resolve to settle that conflict, to, to seek reconciliation, and to show the love of Christ with others. God, if there's sins of pride, of selfishness, of anger, Lord, May you convict us, not just of the big ones, but also the small ones. May we follow you in every area of our life. Lord, we are grateful for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We are unworthy of your grace that you 
have generously given to us. And God, we are grateful for that. So Lord, may we treat this sacrifice of Jesus Christ with the reverence, with the honor. Lord, may we give you the glory for it. And Lord, we thank you for it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask our deacons to come forward as we get ready to celebrate the Lord's table. We're going to pass out the elements as we pass out the elements. If you would hold those, and then we will partake of them all uh, together as a body there together. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ and you've received Jesus Christ as Savior, you are welcome to participate there together with us this morning. first element that we have there is the bread. It says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night at which he uh, was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. Joe, would you ask God's blessing on the bread today? Father, uh, we're 
thankful for the opportunity to gather here for communion this morning, Lord. Uh, as we look to you for the answers, Lord, uh, we're thankful for the sacrifice on the cross, Lord, uh, for a debt that we couldn't pay. We just ask that you bless this bread as we partake of it. In your name, amen. You'll peel off that clear layer with the printed on it. It reveals the bread. He said, take heat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me, in remembrance of him. You pull back that foil layer, it reveals the juice. And the juice reminds us there of the blood of Christ. And so it says there in verse 25, in the same manner, he also took the cup after the supper. And so, Zane, would you ask the blessing on the cup today? Father, we come to you in prayer, asking forgiveness for our sin, and Father, for all the iniquities in us. We thank you, Father, for sending your Son to die on the cross, to shed his blood that might pay for our redemption. Father, we just pray that you just be with us today as we take this memorial, as we remember your finished work on Calvary. Bless it now in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, in remembrance of him. It says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And Mark, would you just ask a blessing on our time here together with this? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for being, being able to be in your house this morning. And we always remember, Father, the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we are so, so thankful for this, Father, for a, a debt that we could not pay, Father. We thank you so much for giving your body and giving your sacrifice on the cross. You just bless us now, Father, and keep us safe. Watch over us as we come back to this evening, Father, to, to come back and learn more about you. In Jesus' blessing and holy name I pray. Amen. You guys want to go ahead and take your seat. It says that when they left that place, they went out singing a hymn. And in just a few moments, we're going to do that. Before we do that, before we leave this place, there's a couple things we just want to remind you of. Uh, they're just kind of by way of announcements as we get ready to leave. Um, and so uh, we're grateful for your, your giving, your financial giving with that, and you uh, remember that. There are two things I want to highlight. There's a couple things that are uh, there on the announcements there. Uh, one is October 10th begins our women's Bible study, which is just about a week away. And so there is a sign-up list downstairs on the table. If you'd like to be a, a part of this for our ladies' Bible study, we try and alternate these uh, men's and women's Bible studies. So if you have young children at home, uh, one of the parents can stay home and take care of the kids, and the other one can come and be uh, spiritually blessed there by a Bible study so that we're not having both men's and women's Bible studies going on there at the same time. And so our, our women's Bible study starts there uh, October 10th. Um, the book is, uh, cover is down there. I, I forget the name of it there. Uh, but uh, sign up is down there. If you'll sign up for that, let us know if you want a book uh, there for that. We would love to have you come and to be a part of that. Uh, we've got some other things going Going on, Ladies Friendship Tea, October 21st, Pastor Appreciation, October 23rd, and then October 30th is another one. Uh, every fifth Sunday, we do a fellowship uh, just to kind of build community here within the body of Christ. And so uh, what we're going to do on October 30th is we have a chili cook-off and a pumpkin dessert uh, fellowship contest, I, I, right? Uh, we are inviting you to come and to bring your best chili to be judged in part of a chili cook-off, and we're going to have a, just a great time together. We're going to have a fellowship lunch afterwards where we will partake of those chilies and enjoy those. Uh, you say, well, I don't like chili. Uh, well, then you can come and bring a pumpkin dessert and say, what's a pumpkin dessert? It could be a pumpkin bread, a pumpkin cheesecake, a pumpkin pie, some type of pumpkin dessert. And we're going to have kind of a little bit of competition between both of us, some fun-spirited competition there, uh, and judge those. And then uh, during that, that time, we're also going to have a pumpkin decorating contest there, particularly for our kids, that they can come and decorate a pumpkin, and we'll uh, award a prize there for those as well. Really just a great time to get together and enjoy each other's company and be a part of that. And so that's happening on the 30th, and then the next day on the 31st, we've got the trunk or treat. Uh, and we appreciate lots of candy coming in. Keep it coming. We appreciate that. We will be giving it away that night uh, there, right? We're going to 
generously give as God's given to us. And so uh, sign up to decorate a car, to be a part of that. All those sign-ups are on that table downstairs. And so I always like it when you shake my hand and head out the door that way. But if you need to head out the door that way to go to the sign-up table, you go ahead and do that too. I will shake your hand at some other time there. Uh, but we're glad to be able to do it. We're grateful for what Jesus Christ has done for us. And uh, a word of blessing as we consider the Lord's table that we've just celebrated comes from 1 John chapter 2. Two things real quick. Um, choir practice this evening is canceled. I've got something I have to do this afternoon, and I'm not sure I'll make it back in time. So we're not going to have choir practice this evening. But the Thursday evening, this Thursday evening on the, the 6th, we're doing the choir kickoff uh, for fall, including a listening of the Christmas music. So 6 to 8 o'clock Thursday evening here in the sanctuary. I'm hoping that we can have some child care available, but uh, that's no, no practice tonight, but be here Thursday. <laughs> Put it on your calendar there. 1 John chapter 2, in light of the Lord's table that we said this, Now little children, abide in Him, that when He appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. We're going to stand together. We're going to close today by singing that hymn. We're going to do it from memory. Blessed be the tie that binds. Bob's going to lead us there together in that. Blessed be the tie.